want us to talk about something that affects all of us, and that's sin. When we look to Romans 3, verse 23, it clearly tells us that all have fallen and shall fall short, or all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when we look to this, it is universal, with the exception, of course, of Jesus the Christ. He is the only one without sin. And this is a problem that has plagued mankind since the beginning. From the Garden of Eden, when, when Adam and Eve partook of that forbidden fruit and sin entered the world, it caused a separation between them and God in, in that spiritual sense, and that they had disobeyed God. And then eventually, of course, that they had been separated from God by being cast from the Garden itself. And from that time forward, there was the need for a Redeemer. There was someone that would need to come in order to restore this relationship that man once had with God. And so when we come to Romans 3, in verse 23, and Paul writes this universal you know, uh, analysis that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he is writing here in answer to some objections to what he has previously written here in the book of Romans. And he uses several Old Testament verses to show that none are righteous. That there, there is no one previously who has not sinned, again, with the same exception of Jesus Christ himself. And therefore, there, there is no means of justification or redemption within oneself. It is only through Jesus the Christ. And he says that God, though, God has revealed to us a way of redemption. He, he has revealed this way through Jesus the Christ. Now, notice what he says here. Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but then he says, they are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. You can't be saved in and of yourself because you are universally plagued with the problem of sin. And so how is this redemption, how is this justification going to come about? He tells us, well, it is through Christ Jesus. This need for redemption due to the sin which we're all guilty of. There's not one of us here that can claim that we are without sin. And this sin is separating us from God and from his blessings. We see that sin, it separates us spiritually from God, and just as it did in the beginning. And there is now a physical separation between us and God. Notice that man originally was in the garden. God walked in the garden. God made his place in the tabernacle, later in the temple. And he was with man. He sent his son. And his son walked this earth among man. But there is still that separation. In the Old Testament, they couldn't go beyond the veil. With, with, with Christ, he's ascended, and we are not there yet. And there's still this separation, so there's still this need for redemption and justification, which only comes through Jesus Christ. And so we have to examine and explore what is the meaning of sin. Because when we understand something and we know what it is, we can then avoid it. Look with me to 1 John chapter 5. In 1 John chapter 5, we pick up in verse 17. And in 1 John, John is talking about sin in various locations of this. But in verse 17, note what he says. All wrongdoing is sin. But there is sin which is not moral. Notice what he says. All wrongdoing is sin. And thus far, John has written to, to warn Christians about sin. He, he is telling us that it is possible, even once you have been saved, to return to sin. That just because you have accepted Christ, you have been washed in the blood of Christ, you're, you're now a child of God, a Christian, you can still return to your old ways. You're not exempt from sin. Just as Paul said, all have sinned. And the fact that we, we have become Christians does not remove us from that possibility of sinning. In 1 John chapter 1, he's writing to Christians. And he says, if we say we have no sin, then we're liars. And we make God a liar. And so we're not removed or exempted from sin still. But we've been washed of those old sins and we are seeking a new way of life, having been washed of sin, having put to death the old man of sin, as Paul talks about in Romans.
Romans 6, having risen to new life. In Romans chapter 6, uh, 12, he talks about having our minds transformed, and so we seek to sin less. And if we do sin, well, guess what? We have an avenue through Jesus the Christ, the righteous one, that we can go to God in prayer and we can be forgiven of sin. That's what he talks about in Romans, or in uh, 1 John chapter 1. But notice what he says here, that all sin is wrongdoing. All sin is that which is contrary to God and to his will for us. Again, Romans 6, 23, it reminds us that all have sinned, and that sin results in death. That's the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, verse 23. The death being that eternal separation from God. That, that being outside of God's will, outside of his grace, outside of his mercy and of his love. In Isaiah 59, in verse 2, it tells us also that sin separates us from our God. Your iniquities have separated you from your God, and, and he will not hear you. Notice it's our sin. It's an individual thing. I can't sin for somebody else. They can't sin for me. It's something that I do. It's an act. And that death, that eternal separation, I suffer that. Ezekiel will go on to tell us that the soul who sins shall die in Ezekiel 18. I can't sin, and, and you suffer the consequences for it, nor can you sin, and I suffer the consequences for an individual sin. Now, you might sin and do something, like drink and decide to drive a car, and, and you strike me as I'm going down the road. Now, I may suffer the consequences of that sin, but that individual sin, we each will experience for ourselves. I can't sin for another person. Romans 10, verse 17, it tells us that faith comes by fear. And hearing by the word of God. And so whatever is not of faith is sin. Paul tells us in Romans 14, in verse 23. And so we understand that faith comes by hearing. Christianity is a learned thing. But God gives us instruction. And when we disobey that instruction, we have then sinned. We have gone outside of what God has told us. And that becomes wrongdoing. And John tells us wrongdoing is and so when we seek to understand God's word, and we know God's word, and we don't do it, it's wrongdoing. And then to us it is sin. We see the same thing James would write in James 4.17. For he who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. And so now we understand. Sin is a violation of God's law. It's doing that which is not within faith. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So it's wrongdoing that not doing what God has said, then is sin to us. Look at Matthew 15. In Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 18, we read, But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a man. For out of, a, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander, these are what defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Now, Jesus here, he is answering a, a question. He's responding to this son that had placed tradition above God's law. Well, why do your disciples, you know, violate the law of Moses? Well, he had also asked them another time, why do you violate God's commands by your tradition? And so they had made this mistaken idea because we talked about the Bible class this morning with Peter and the house of Cornelius and the difference between what God calls clean and unclean, that vision that Peter has in Acts chapter 10, that what God has called clean, we cannot call unclean. And then with God, there's no differentiation between Jew and Gentile. Now, the gospel was for everybody. And that was the point of Bible class this morning. But here Jesus is pointing out, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. The food that you eat, it goes to the stomach, it's digested, and it's passed from the body. But what comes out of the mouth? You start about what goes into our hearts. What do we put in our mind? What is in our inner man? And, and this list here, much like what Paul gives list, this is not a all-inclusive list. It, it, Jesus, Jesus, you know, where is the man? There's some talk that maybe the man was one of the Pharisees. Maybe he was guilty. Why he wasn't there. Don't know that for sure. Theft, yeah, we know that they were in another place. He, he accuses them of robbing widows. False witness, well, they did that against Jesus, didn't they? There was a, 
goes and bore false witness, slander even. He says these are what the five He knows they're false. And so Jesus is addressing that here. It's not what goes in the belly. These words are, are coming from the Lord himself, talking about our thoughts and our intentions, our inner man, what is truly inside us. And, and we, what do we want to fill our hearts with? That which pollutes us, and he's not talking about the crudes. What goes in our minds? What are we watching? What are we listening to? What draws our attention and our interest? Yeah, it, it's very hard. Gene and I have talked about this several times. You know, we just took a trip to Georgia and back. And, you know, and what do you listen to on the radio? What station do you tune into? You know, I sit there, I listen to songs, and Gina and I talk about that. I listen to songs that, you know, when I was younger, I listened to songs. Oh, that was my favorite song. That's my favorite artist. And now as an adult and as a Christian and as a father, I sit there and I listen to the words of the song, and I'm like, this is not a good, wholesome song. I love this song as a child, but I'm listening to it. And it's not, the lyrics are not presenting very good moral teaching. Television. Uh, there's several movies I, I remember as a child, that, you know, growing up as a teenager, as a young adult, movies that I loved. And it's like, that was a great movie. I'd love to share that with my children. And then you start listening to it, and every other word is, a, you know, I can't watch this. And it, it's, it's disappointing sometimes. But we have to have our mind renewed. We have to be to that perfect will of God. But what goes into us is what's going to come out. In Isaiah 1, in the first six verses, Isaiah shows how sin has an effect on the whole body. Now, he's speaking in, in how it had affected the nation of Israel. But actually, in effect, we can apply that even greater. None of us lives in a bubble. We're, none of us are separated from one another. If I have sin within me and I have evil thoughts and intentions, it's going to come out. It's going to come out either with my co-workers, with my family, my friends. You know, as a father, it's amazing. It's, it's scary sometimes to see your children and how they emulate you. And it really starts to make you question, how are you acting and behaving? Because, you know, you do things. Then you see it come out of your child. And you realize this isn't right. I, I, I wouldn't want somebody to act like that. But where did they get it from? What goes into us? And it comes out. And Paul says sin has an effect on the whole world when we read Romans 5 and verse 12. And it's because of all the sin. No matter where I go, what I do. Yeah, you know, there, there was, I remember watching, this is probably from another movie that if I go back and review the movie, I'd probably go, oh, maybe I should watch that movie. But I, but I remember this guy saying, no matter where you go, there you are. It's true. You know, we can attempt to try and remove ourselves from certain situations, even certain people, but wherever you go, there you are. And if you're in sin, your sin goes with you. You need to leave that behind. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, we leave that person, that old man of sin, behind in the waters of baptism. And we go down into these waters, and we're washed. And we come up out of the waters as a new creation. And Paul tells us, we shouldn't go back to the things that once defiled us. Why? How many of us would get a brand new car? Because the old one was falling apart, the paint was faded. Do we go to the car dealer and go, you know, I want 2021. But can you make the roof faded? And can you put some rips in the seats? And can you make it drip oil? Why would we do that? Why would we come up out of the waters of baptism and just go back to the way we lived our lives before? And so Paul is making this point that we all sin. And it has an influence. And it's not the things around us, but what we let into us. And what we let out of us. Look at John chapter 3. What is, what is the work of sin? When we think about sin. In John 3, in verse 18, John writes, He who believes in him 
is not condemned. He's speaking of Jesus. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Salvation is only in Christ. If we believe Jesus is the Christ, well, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. If we truly believe that he is who he says he is, then we're going to do the things he asks us to do. In Bible class this morning, we were reading from Deuteronomy, even in the Old Testament, God said, those who love me and keep my commandments, those are my people. The Jews had a hard time of understanding when the Gentiles were being included into God's plan of salvation. But God clearly had said from the very beginning, his intent was a redeemer for all mankind. Redemption was for everybody. And he says it was for those who love me and keep my commandments. That was the only qualifier. It's, it's like anything in life. There, there are certain qualifications. God has done his part. He, he sent his son into this world to die for us. He sent the Holy Spirit to deliver his word to us so that we may know it. Now it's on us. Will we be obedient to what he has given us? And that's where free will comes into play. We, we, we have a choice. But if we don't believe, then we're not going to be obedient. And, and not being obedient, we're not going to do the things that God has said to do, and we are not going to inherit salvation. We're not going to take and go into the waters of baptism, believing that Jesus is the Christ and confessing that before others. We're not going to rise up out of the waters, believing that there is a judgment day coming, that there is an eternal hell and an eternal heaven. And we're going to let the sins of this world continue to plague us because we don't truly believe. You see, if we truly believe, we wouldn't go back to those things that had defiled us. And so, from the very beginning, there has been Satan's plan to deceive. Doesn't it tell us that he's a deceiver? That he's a liar and the father of it? Why? If I can put one little bit of doubt in your mind to lead you away from Jesus, to lead you away from truly believing 100%, well then, I've won you. That's Satan's plan. If I can deceive, think about in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. Has God said you can't eat from every tree in the garden? He didn't say you couldn't eat from every tree. He said you couldn't eat from one tree. Didn't he say you will surely die? He was tricking her. He was deceiving her. But her own desire was part of it. Because when she looked upon the tree and saw that it was good to eat, that it was pleasant to the eye, he was able to make one wise. Just what James tells us, it's our own desire that we give in to sin. <coughs> and if I take that desire away, then the devil can't trick me. If I put the word of God in my heart, the devil can't lead me away. In Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was tempted, and make no mistake, he was tempted. Yet he quoted scripture. It is written. But it's what goes into us. Is it the word of God that when the devil tries to tempt us that we can say it is written? Or are we filling our minds with things that are leading us away in our own desires that when the devil tempts us, we're like, ooh, that looks good. He's deceiving us. One little sin, surely God, you know, I, I've done all these other attaboys. Surely there's one thing God won't mind. I, I don't think God will truly send, you know, somebody who's a good person to hell. And you know, the thing is, God doesn't send anyone to hell. Exactly, Sister Brenda. We send ourselves there. God just honors our choice. God will honor our choice, whatever it is we decide. And that's Satan's plan, Genesis 3, that he sought to create unbelief in Eve. If I could just lead you away, if you would just doubt this little bit, and then you would not be obedient. And the consequences, God had told them, and the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Did they die that very day? Spiritually. And at that point, death entered the world, and they began the physical death. God keeps his promises. God does not lie. And so the devil, though, he lies. He causes us to fall away, to be separated. And Luke 12 and verse 9 is telling us that if we deny Christ, he will also deny us before the angels of God. straight from Jesus' own mouth. If you deny me, I will deny you. You know, 
know the saddest words in the Bible? Depart from me, I never knew you. Can you imagine our whole life not living in a life consistent with what God calls us to? And in, and in the day of judgment, or the day of our death, to realize, oh wait, all this is true that I read about in the Bible, that people try to share with me, that I heard. It tells us, you know, there is a day coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But that point, whatever decisions we made in life, whatever choices we made that have determined our destiny, it's not going to matter at that day whether I led a whole life of disobedience and sin. And on that day, I, my, I bow my, on my knees and I confess Jesus Christ is Lord and God is real. Because if my life has been filled with sin, my destination is already determined. You know, some people seem to think the day of judgment is a day where we'll be able to come forth and we'll be judged and give our plea or, and defend our case. And that day really is a day of sentencing. The judgment's already been made. We make it by how we lived our lives. In Proverbs 22, verse 5 explains our own sin traps us. And in Romans 6, verses 16 to 17, Paul describes sin in its natural form as a slave master. He says, don't you know you, that whichever one you present yourselves as slaves to obey, that one slaves you are? Whether it's sin leading to death or righteousness leading to life. You know, we get a choice. Isn't that amazing? We get a choice. It's totally upon us to decide. God provides us all the information. He sets forth all of his commandments. And he doesn't hold back. He tells us right out, if you do this, then I will do this. And so when the things that are going to happen one day befall us, we should not be surprised. We, we should not be in a state of wonderment. How did I end up here? Whether it be in hell or in heaven. Certainly when we get to heaven, you know, certainly we should be living a life as uh, the lesson tonight, we're going to talk about some things we can know. And if you know you're living a life that is consistent with God's word, we should not get to heaven and go, how did I get here? We should know that's our destination. But what about the consequences? Let's look at Galatians 6. Galatians 6, beginning in verse 7. Paul writes to the church in Galatia, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his own flesh will from, it, from the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. Paul had already written previously, uh, of the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. And he, he detailed that. And now he uses a, a very easily understood example. Even if you are not a farmer, we understand reaping and sowing. You get exactly what you sow. If I were to plant corn seed, I'm going to get corn. I'm not going to go out into the field one day and expect wheat in a cornfield. Gina's got a banana banana tree in the yard. About six months we're hoping to get some bananas. I do not expect to go out to that banana tree and find tomatoes. I'm going to get exactly what has been sowed. And Paul uses a very easily understood analogy here, having already spoken about the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. You're going to receive in kind exactly what you sowed in life. If you sow to the Spirit, you're going to receive of the Spirit. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to receive of the flesh. That should not surprise us. It's easily understood. You're going to get in accordance with what you have done. And he writes similar to the Corinthians. When we look to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, and he talks about how we all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And there's a great verse right there. All, it's universal, must, there's no exceptions. Stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and each will receive... What, for what they have done in the body, whether good or bad. You're going to get what you sow. Because God is righteous. And God honors our choices, good or bad. And so Paul tells us we should not.
not be surprised. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, showing us a consequence from sin is separation from God. If we lead a life separated from God, should it make him surprise us then when we end up with an eternity separated from God? That should be no surprise at all, should it? So on Facebook the other day, it says, uh, well, how, did, how did it go? It says, uh, why would you want to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus when you don't spend any time with him? You know, the same could be said for our brethren. Why would you want to spend eternity in heaven with, with the saints when you don't want to spend time with them now? You know, sometimes we hear these things and they kind of cut us, don't they? But we stop and we think about it and, and we get over being offended and we think of what we're really saying. <clears throat> If I don't want to spend time with somebody right now, why would I want to spend eternity with them? And that's our goal, to get to heaven and to take as many people with us as we can. <clears throat> and if we don't want to take people with us to heaven, well, John talks about how can we love God and not love our brother? There's an inconsistency. There's, a, there's consequences that we see. James 1, verse 15, speaks of sin as leading to death, as spiritual death, as separation from God. That eternity without him. Uh, and, and it's described as an outer darkness where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth. And I don't know about you, but that does not sound like a place I want to be. I, I just, you know, God gives us images, and, and these images are so pale in comparison to what the reality is going to be. I think of Revelation and John describing the, the heavenly city, the holy Jerusalem, and its streets of gold and all these jewels that he uses to describe as gates of pearl. John's trying to describe something that you and I have never seen. That there's nothing that we can compare it to. I, I think of the rich man and Lazarus, and it speaks of a place of torment, and the rich man would be like a, a drop of water just from the tip of Lazarus' fingertip on his tongue. And that would be so relieving. Can we even begin to really imagine what the reality is like when we get just an image like that? It's going to be far worse than what we can imagine. Because We've never seen anything like it. But again, God warned our choices. And so there is a sin leading to death. There, there is a, a cure, though. Isn't that the wonderful thing? There's a cure. Yeah, I know right now we're, we're going around in the world and, and you know, there's this, this epidemic. And I've heard people say, I'm not leaving my house until there's a cure. Well, there may never be a cure. Are you going to stay in your house your entire life? But God tells us there is a cure for sin. This universal problem that plagues every single one of us. You may catch the coronavirus, you may not catch the coronavirus, but you are going to sin at some point in your life. It's going to happen. And you're going to need the cure. Well, look at Galatians chapter 1. Because in Galatians chapter 1, in the first five verses, notice what Paul writes here. Because he's giving us a cure. He says, Paul... An apostle, not from men nor from man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me to the church of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever. Here Paul states to the church that meets in Galatia, there's a fact that there is a cure. There is a Savior that God has given Jesus himself for the forgiveness of our sins. Deliverance from sins and a return to God are made available one, by Jesus doing the will of the Father. Jesus said that he was here and he was about the will of the Father. The things he spoke were the things the Father gave him to speak. The, all the things he did, even when he went to the cross, he prayed to the Father, if this cup should fall from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will. And before the foundations of the world, God had made this plan that he would send Christ Jesus. And so this is God's will. 
And in doing God's will, Jesus became the means of salvation to those who believe in him. And if we believe in him, we've already discussed. We're going to be obedient to the things he's told us. We're going to do the things that he has asked us to do. And we will then obtain forgiveness. Those sins are washed away. And if we sin again, well, we have an advocate with the Father. Not that we seek to sin again. With our desires to sin less. But because we're plagued with sin, we will sin. But yet, he's given us a means for that too. Isn't that amazing? If we, if we would accept Jesus Christ and his commandments, and we were buried in the waters of baptism, having confessed the, the, the Son as the Messiah, that he washes away our sin, and that blood, when we go to 1 John 1, that blood constantly cleanses us. If we would repent and we would confess to the Father. He's made this plan. He, he has made this cure for us. Here's a cure for your sin, and if you sin again, guess what? The cure keeps working. It's available to all, but will we choose to take it? Every year, I personally choose not to take a flu shot. Every year I take a flu shot, I get the flu. I haven't taken it in years. It's a choice. I can make that choice. God provided the cure. It's our choice whether we want to take it. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, Paul explains that Jesus became sin for us. Can you imagine that? that? That we might become the righteousness of God in him because he took our sin upon himself. You ever have anyone pay off a debt for you? Ever have somebody, you know, let me just pay off your car. Let me pay off your house. Yeah, let me pay off that credit card. Anyone ever done that for you? If they have, were you thankful? If they did do something like that, wouldn't you be thankful? And then we think about Christ. If he paid the debt for all of our sins, every single one of us, and, and he bore our guilt that we could be accounted righteous because he bore that guilt and the death. He took it to the cross and he suffered what should have rightfully been our punishment. But he took it upon himself. In Acts 4, verse 12, it also declares that there is salvation in no other than Jesus Christ. There is no one else. We can't have salvation in ourselves. We can't have salvation in another person. I can't have salvation through somebody who died 100 years ago. But I can have salvation through the one who died and was raised about 2,000 years ago. Only in Christ Jesus. Matthew 26, verse 28, Jesus said that his blood was shed for the remission or the forgiveness of sins. And on the day of Pentecost, when we read Acts chapter 2, and the people were caught in the heart learning they had just killed the Messiah, that this Jesus who you killed, God has made Lord in Christ, they were caught in the heart and asked, men and brethren, what must we do? They were told to repent and be baptized for what? The remission of sins. Exactly what Jesus said that his blood was for. Well, how do I contact that blood of Christ? Repent and be baptized. And if I have any doubts of that, it tells us that day about 3,000 were added to them. And in Acts 2, verse 47, it says that the Lord was adding daily to the church those who were being saved. Who were those being saved? Those who were obedient, who repented and were baptized, having believed. You know, it's not hard to understand. And it's sad that some people want to change verses around and they want to make baptism not a part of salvation. It's clear that God has determined that this was the way to salvation. How do we contact the blood of Christ? Well, he tells us through the precious blood of Jesus Christ that you are baptized into Christ through water. That's how we contact the blood. That's what they did on the day of Pentecost. It's what they did all through the book of Acts. That remission of sins to which they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That being salvation. It's exactly what it tells us in Acts 2. <clears throat> and that we might be saved is due to the fact that while God has fulfilled his part, there's still a part upon us. You know, I can provide everything you need to bake a cake. But unless you take those ingredients and you start mixing them together and you put it in the oven, you're never going to get a cake. Jesus has provided the means of salvation. But if we don't avail ourselves to it, it 
doesn't do us any good. It's like those cake ingredients. Just sitting in the cup. My dad asked Gina for a chocolate cake when she went to the grocery store a couple weeks ago. And she brought back cake mix and a tub of frosting and you know, eggs and milk. And then a couple nights later, I'm like, where's my cake? It's in the cupboard. I'm thinking, you know, those ready-made cakes and candy just pop the paint. I go over there, I'm like, there's no cake in here. She goes, yeah, it is. And there's a box of cake. I had to make my own cake. But, you know, there are requirements upon us. Look, look to, to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. We look at verse 24 here. And Jesus is warning against unbelief. And in verse 24, he says, I told you that you will die in your sins, for you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. We have to believe. We have to believe Jesus is the Christ. You know, this is, this is the confession that Peter made when we look to Matthew chapter 16, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we looked at Acts chapter 8, it's the confession that the Ethiopian made. You know, here is water which hinders me from being baptized, or if you believe with all your heart, you may. Well, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. If we don't believe that, then, then we don't acknowledge it. And, and we, what, what, what's the point? If we don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, if we don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah who was dead and brought back to life by God, and who ascended to the throne of God and, and is sitting at the right hand, and, and he's going to come back one day for those who are his, if we don't believe that, what does anything else else matter? You know, you know, in Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. See, he says believe, because if you believe, you're going to do all the things that are required, including baptism. He says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. And in that belief, there is the confession, I believe Jesus is the Christ. There's the confession through our lives that we're going to put into our bodies the things that come out of our bodies, which are going to be whole and pure and you know, good. But if I don't believe, I'm not going to do any of those things. If I don't believe, and I go into the waters of baptism. Mm -hmm. What good did it do me? I just got wet. Because if I didn't believe, in fact, if I don't believe our Bible, we can go into the water of baptism. But if, if, if I don't believe and I do get baptized, what does it do? And that's why he says in the next verse, but he who does not believe will be condemned. You know, oh, well, it doesn't say anything about baptism in the second verse. It doesn't have to because it doesn't matter if you didn't believe. You just got wet. So Jesus is very clear on this. And there's a preaching of the gospel. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we hear the gospel like those on the day of Pentecost. They heard, they believed. They said men have read in what must be doing. And they were instructed what to do. Yeah, here's the thing. God did his part. He sent his son to die upon the earth. You've been waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah came and killed him. Well, what do we do now? God fulfilled his part. Now here's your part. You have heard, you believed. And then they're asking, what must we do? Essentially, they were saying, I believe Jesus is the Christ. Well, why would they say, what do we need to do? And so there is all these things, these requirements upon us. And it's what Satan seeks to undermine. This is what Satan seeks to deceive us of. Because if we're not obedient, such as not believing, and I get baptized, well, I'm saved. But I might go around believing that I'm saved. There's many in the world today that are told that baptism is not essential for salvation. Now, baptism is not the only requirement for salvation. You know, let, let's not get confused. You know, sometimes people put a lot of emphasis on baptism, but it is not the only requirement for salvation. But there are those who teach that baptism is not essential for salvation. Let me ask you, is, is there anything that God tells us to do that is not essential? If God tells us to do it, is it, is it optional? Why then would we take something that God tells us to do and then say, well, it's not essential for salvation? Whether, and again, this goes back to the belief. If you do not believe and he says to do something, you're not going to do it. But Satan seeks to deceive us. Just like 
eating in the garden. Well, you won't surely die. Baptism is not really essential. Leading a life, having risen from the waters, be faithful unto death. Revelation 2 and verse 10. You don't really need to be faithful unto death. Once you've been baptized, once saved, always saved. Is that what the Bible teaches? If that's what the Bible teaches, that once saved, always saved, then why does John, when we talk about 1 John chapter 1, tell us if we say we have no sin, that we deceive ourselves and we make him a liar? Why does he tell us then, if we sin again, and we will? But he tells us, the blood of Jesus constantly cleanses us. How? If we confess to the Father, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins. Look at 1 John chapter 1. It's written to Christians. If you're a once saved, always saved, I don't know what John is writing about. But, see, these are the ways the devil tries to trick us, tries to deceive us. That one little sin, that one little thing, it's not really that big a deal. God will still save you as long as you're a good person. You know, Jesus addressed that too. Think about Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Oh, there were people, they were doing many good works, weren't they? Casting out demons, doing good works. But what does he say? They weren't doing the will of the Father. What is that? We can do good things. We talked about Bible class this morning, Cornelius. Here is Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. He is a, a God-fearing man. He's devout. He's one who believes in God. He's giving alms to the poor. But yet, Peter still needed to come to him and preach the gospel because without the blood of Christ, just being a good person was not enough to save him. He still needed the blood of Christ. These things are necessary. Beings and, and doing what is necessary, the requirements that God has laid out for us. These aren't the devising of men. When we think about the things God has given us to do, these aren't works of men. These are the requirements of God. And they're essential. And then you can't remove any one of them. But let's think about the necessity of being saved. And lastly, we're going to look at Acts chapter 2 this morning. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 38, we brought this up a moment ago, but it says, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Talked about this already. They heard, they believed, and they were told what they must do. Repent. Turn from your former conduct. Turn from your former ways of doing things. Turn from sin. But it's more than that. Because having turned from those, you need to turn to God. You need to be obedient to the things God has told us to do. You need to be obedient. And again, we, if we don't, if we don't, Luke 13 and verse 3 and verse 5, Jesus says it twice. If we don't repent, we will die in our sins. And if we die in our sins, unrepented of, we will be lost eternally. There, there's no going back once we've left this life. We, we can't change our destiny. Destination. Lazarus and the rich man. Oh, how the rich man longed to, you know, he had brothers. But Lazarus would just go back and warn his brothers. How many of us have loved ones that are passed from this life that if they could have one opportunity, they would tell us? Be obedient to what God has said. There really is a next life. There really is a hell. There really is a hell. You know, I always thought about Lazarus and the rich man. And the rich man said, if one were to go back from the dead, all oh, my brothers would listen. They, they would listen. If Moses told them they had Abraham and the prophets, they have Moses and the prophets, if they won't hear them, neither will they hear one should he raise from the dead. You know, in my younger years, I thought, man, if somebody came back from the dead, I'd listen to them. If I saw somebody, saw somebody raised from the dead, I'd listen to them. I, 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 I'd pay attention to what they I think of the other Lazarus who Jesus raised, Mary and Martha's brother. And when news came back to the Pharisees that Lazarus had been raised from the dead, their response was, kill him. I don't want to hear what he has to say. 
Here's somebody come back from the dead. He may have valuable knowledge. You know the cemetery? They're full of knowledge. I, there are people that have passed this life. I wish I could have 10 more minutes with them. But they're gone. And here's Lazarus, raised from the dead. Man, I would like to talk to that gentleman. So they said, kill him. The other person spoke about eternal life. They did kill him. And when he raised from the dead, they still didn't all listen. Think about the day of Pentecost. Josephus predicts two and a half million people could have been in Jerusalem that day for the Passover. They had come for the Passover and we were still in Jerusalem. Two and a half million people. And in Acts chapter 2, it tells us that about 3,000 were saved. Surely, if one came back from the dead, we believe, right? But John tells us in the end of his gospel that all of these things were recorded so that we might believe. And believing, we may have eternal life. But the devil tries to get great. He wants to lead us away. He wants to deceive us. We have to be diligent. And we must be baptized. Galatians 3, verse 27 tells us, Baptism places us into Christ. Colossians 3.16 tells us that all spiritual blessings are where? In Christ. And Romans 6 showing us that being baptized into Christ, we have put to death our sin. And it assures us as a resurrection coming that we will be resurrected as Christ was resurrected. The question is, do we believe that? That's what we are are we dead in our sins? Or is Paul wrote to the Ephesians, have we accepted the invitation and been made alive in Christ Jesus? And if we're alive in Christ Jesus, are we seeking to retain that salvation that he has given us? Being faithful unto death. This morning, ask yourself, if you are a child of God, you are one who has heard You were put into the waters of baptism, buried, immersed, risen to newness of life. Are you remaining faithful? And if you're not remaining faithful, well, we've discussed it. He's given us a means. Repentance and prayer. And he's faithful and just to forgive us. And if you're not a child of God, you have not done those things. Where are you at? We offer the invitation. We can help in any way. We invite you to come forward as we stand and sing.